Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here in, uh, in Berlin and more pleasure talking about marketplaces, no? which has been our bread and butter since I started my first company when I was 22. So um, I actually teach a part of a class in the G GSB at Stanford and you know, a lot of the things that I'm going to share with you guys today are some of the things that I try to convey to some of the students and hopefully, you know, here probably we have a more expert audience than maybe business school people. But, um, but you know, I'm going to try to convey to you what are some of the key dynamics that we see in marketplaces, what is some of the trends that we're seeing and some of the opportunities that we believe exist still in the area of marketplaces moving forward. No? So, you know, to kick it off, uh, we all know that ideal conditions for marketplaces are when we have very fragmented supply with very fragmented demand, you know, and you have a number of other functions that are broken, like discovery, trust, communication, price transparency, etc. No, and, and the objective of marketplaces is to be able to fix this problem in a much better and efficient way. Um, and it is critical, uh, you know, to understand that most of the marketplaces are demand constrained. It's true that you have some that are supply constrained. So when you go about building a new marketplace, generally you have to think first about the supply. Now, as you start to scale it, uh, you have to be smart around the way you balance it. Because at the end, if you have too much supply, uh, you know, and you don't have demand, then the people that are listing on the supply side, they would say, hey, nobody's buying. And if you have too much demand and you don't have enough supply, then the people who buy will not find what they want. No? So it is quite important as you start and start building this, you know, to think about this. And as we know, the network effects that we experience on marketplaces, especially on those that are category killers, you know, can create incredible barriers uh, for businesses. Um, in terms of the most, uh, you know, how do we categorize uh, business models? No, uh, we have horizontal business models, uh, companies like eBay or Craigslist that pretty much operate in a whole bunch of different environments uh, and, you know, and businesses both for products and services. Then you have the vertical ones that pretty much are companies that have been built by taking some of the verticals of the horizontals and just, you know, going deeper into them. Uh, in terms of monetization, generally, we have seen two big trends, one which is the listing model um, or classified model, traditionally uh, advertising or the transactional. No? Um, and it is important to, to think that there is different ways of monetizing marketplaces. You, you can think about a listing fee, like I said before, or even visibility. These are two advertising things. And you also we have been actually very interested of, of SaaS-enabled marketplaces. A lot of the SaaS-enabled uh, businesses that we see eventually turn into building transactional operations. No? So it is super critical sometimes to be able to have the right product to be able to incent either the supply and the demand before you become transactional. No? And then the traditional way of thinking of the take rate uh, or the rake when you build a marketplace is how much of the volume that goes through your marketplace can you take? And then, you know, what type of economics do you have related to that? Now, uh, for us, uh, we are very unit economics driven when we think about marketplaces. So at the end, we always think about GMV first. And once we know what the GMV is, then we think about, okay, so what's the take rate of that? Then once we know what the take rate is, um, you know, that transformed into revenue, then we say, okay, what is the gross margin for that? And once we know the gross margin on a per unit basis, we compare it against the cost of acquisition of different channels. No? And, and, and what we traditionally li like to see are businesses where we pay back at least two times paid CAC uh, in a period of 12 months, or, you know, better to pay three times in a period of 18 months. And, when we start to fall into that path is when we start to think that this is a marketplace that has the right dynamics and have the right economics. No, and what I can say is that there's cases where we invest in companies that are not there, but we have a very credible feeling, you know, that by investing and building scale, we're going to be able to get there. But certainly we like to see companies that think in this direction, that they say, okay, 
How am I going to continue to build the supply? How am I going to continue to build the demand? How much it costs me to bring new supply, new demand, and how I pay it back? No? Um, so in terms of building a marketplace, I think there is a number of things uh, that, that, that we like to think about. We, uh, we have seen a lot of, and we'll talk more about this, but we've seen a lot of disruption on verticals trying to disrupt certain horizontals, and we feel it's very important to experience uh, you know, a fundamental improvement on the way that things happen. So you need to build a product and an experience that is significantly better than what you get with a horizontal. And I think that's, that's something that happens fairly straightforward, fairly easy. Um, we also like to have well thought through economics, like, as I mentioned before, uh, network effects, make sure that the economics are sustainable, that we understand the market dynamics, and that you know, we provide only certain type of services whenever they are you know, paid for or economically viable. A lot of people talk about, ah, you know, um, managed marketplaces don't work. Well, I think a lot, of man a lot of marketplaces have to be managed marketplaces to work well. But you also have to have the right economics to make sure that you can sustain them. So not every single marketplace can be a managed marketplace where you provide you know, a whole bunch of other services and so on. Uh, but, but certainly for those that require a very particular user experience and have the right unit economics, you can actually pull in, pu push in that direction. Um, now, let me talk quickly about some of the trends that we are seeing uh, in marketplaces, uh, which hopefully will help you, know, you guys, probably you will identify with some of these trends as the businesses that you have built or, or, or investing in. But there are some of the things that we are seeing. Food is a category that, that we've been quite active. We've been doing quite a bit through the years. I mean, it's a obviously a very big one, and, and, and the opportunities of disruption you know, have been very big and continue to be very big. And, and what we've seen is a very strong migration of what we call on-premise on revenue. So you know, people used to buy groceries and go to the, to the store and, and, and you know, go to restaurants and eat there. COVID have you know, improved. Uh, a lot, uh, you know, the ability for some of these restaurants or existing, you know, on-premise uh, players to be able to sell offline. But certainly there is a very clear tendency to go off-premise. And that's the reason why, you know, in, in, the, in the grocery sector, we have companies like Instacart or, you know, Amazon, a whole bunch of others. And then from the restaurant perspective, you know, companies, most of these that are here are horizontals, but, you know, companies like Deliveroo or Uber Eats or, you know, Postmates or Grubhub or whatever that have been actually capitalizing on the fact that people like to take food outside of the restaurant and bring it to their own place. Um, now, we are also seeing a very interesting trend here, which is the verticalization of some of these horizontals in the food space. And there's a whole bunch of companies here that I can mention that show the perfect examples. Lice is a platform that started as a, as a, as a SaaS platform that you know, went to pizzerias and said, OK, the guy who runs the pizzeria, what does the guy like to do or woman like to do? Well, they like to cook pizza. They don't necessarily like to think about how do I manage the business or how do I call my suppliers. So, you know, these guys decided to create a vertical platform for pizzerias. You know, pizzerias is a huge space. It's strongly serviced already by companies like Uber Eats and Postmates on the delivery. But there was a huge opportunity to go in there and build a very customized experience uh, for um, you know, for, for pizzerias with a particular software. No? And, and we are seeing a whole bunch of different trends uh, of companies that are being very effective going vertical by providing a very differentiated experience, as I mentioned before. In terms of off-premise emerging models, I mean, we've, we've seen also a lot of companies emerge uh, that try to build infrastructure for, you know, players to be able to, to cook or, 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 or produce uh, in, in separate entities or separate physical locations. You know, that's the emergence of dark kitchens. Not necessarily a business model that I love because it's highly capital intensive. You need a lot of utilization, but certainly one that a lot of people in the, in the value chain can take advantage of. Then you start to see a very strong emergence of vir virtual restaurants. So not only existing restaurants that are utilizing platforms you know, to be able to get online and to be able to deliver their products, but also utilizing uh, their ability to start to build new brands with their existing capacity. You know? So we start to see brands that are being developed by existing play offline players and, and non-offline players, 
you know, to, to create their own brands and to be able to bring, um, you know, to bring uh, certain brands, new brands, into the door of people. A lot of, we don't bet so much on automation and robotics, but there's certainly, you know, a bunch of businesses that we've seen that are being built, capitalizing on, you know, let's say automation and, 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 and technology for, you know, for to make labor more efficient. And then, you know, we have other businesses like vertical groceries. You know, we've seen a very strong push for, you know, either both segments and, 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 and types of food, you know, companies that go vertical or nation food or stuff like that, that have been emerging pretty strongly. Now, in terms of the uh, consumer good models and, and this intermediation for, for SMBs, generally B2B, we've seen also a very strong trend. There's been a number of companies in different geographies that are being effectively built. Uh, an example of this, you know, there's a bunch of examples here. Megaloop is, is, is more on this part of the world. Uh, we invest in a company called, called Cheaper, which is, you know, a platform that pretty much disintermediates the relationship between the brand and the small, uh, small and medium businesses. No? So they create, uh, you know, a seamless experience, or they try to create a seamless experience to, to disintermediate uh, the sourcing and the delivery of products into small and medium businesses. And a whole bunch of these companies are doing well. They have raised capital. Again, the market is changing all the time. And, you know, when you see innovation in business models, sometimes, you know, you see the company growing very quickly and then things change very fast. But, um, but that's a very clear trend. Now, in terms of uh, vertical, vertical labor uh, models, there's, there's a lot to say here. Uh, companies like, like uh, A-Team, uh, I, you, guys, you guys might know it, but, but, but they are pretty much going vertical on, on helping companies, it's a bit to be, helping companies, um, you know, hire software developers, no? and, 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 you know, they are pretty much supporting a, a, a very real demand for companies to, you know, to have access to, to talent, you know, in a, in, a, in a seamless way, but also in a verticalized fashion, no? and, and they've been, you know, monetizing you know, in a similar fashion, but they've been also using some crypto-enabled mechanisms to be able to incent supply and demand, and I think that's interesting. I'll talk a little bit about that after. Um, so there's other business models. Uh, this actually is a model that uh, fits 100% or thesis, and when I wrap up the conversation, I'll tell you where is where we see things going. But a rig up that eventually became WorkRise. It's a B2B marketplace that go vertical into, into, the, into the oil and gas industry and also is what we call a marketplace peak model, which means that the platform is the one that decides who the supply should be. And these are three characteristics that are pretty relevant in terms of how do we think of marketplaces uh, that we like and that we find attractive. No? And the, you know, this, company, this company had a little bit of a hump in the last year and a half uh, because of, of the COVID situation, but, but they've been growing incredibly well and you know, they have raised significant capital. We continue to be super, super bullish on the fact that they're a bit to be vertical, um, uh, that is marketplace pick. Um, then we also invest in, in another company called Trusted Health, which is another example of verticalization in health. Um, it's a labor marketplace to be able to find healthcare professionals. And once again, uh, this relies on the fact that the sourcing of those healthcare professionals is not that trivial. And the marketplace do a lot of screening and a lot of uh, vetting of the supply, you know, and then eventually, uh, you know, the demand uh, uh, Try and try to match the demand for some, some categories that are actually very hard to get people. No? And, and I think that's one of the beauty of these models, that they can actually make things that are physically way harder, much more efficient by the utilization of technology. Uh, we've also seen some interesting innovation on, on the creator and passion economy. I mean, this is a controversial company, uh, but, but certainly fairly successful. So, you know, OnlyFans has, has been able to grow very, very strongly and very, very quickly. And, and frankly, you know, it's, it's an opportunity and I don't specifically talk about the, the purpose of, of OnlyFans, but I think there is a, a platform that is giving people the opportunity to get paid to do something that they like and, and, you know, and it gives people the ability to monetize on that. And I think that's a very clear trend 
uh, on the passion economy to be able to have platforms that allow you to do something that you like. And once you are doing something that you like in an effective way, have the ability to monetize it. No? And you know, uh, this is a very clear trend. Uh, there's another company we invested in, which is, which is called Hobla. It's a Latin American player. And they're pretty much leveraging the fact that, that WhatsApp is you know, very relevant in, in, in certain Latin American regions. And, and, and they are uh, providing a platform uh, you know, to do online coaching you know, through WhatsApp. And, and that gives them the ability not only to reach certain segment of clients, but also to have the possibility of you know, building a very interesting strategy on monetization. Also, very interesting uh, trend as well, uh, and, and, and a trend that we expect to see develop more and more for markets where WhatsApp plays a more important uh, role. Um, I talked also about the importance of, of SaaS-enabled marketplaces. We uh, generally feel that uh, there's a lot of uh, situations where uh, the companies can benefit of having a certain type of product that is going to enhance either the supply or the demand, uh, you know, in order to start building that experience for the users. And you know, we've seen a number of very interesting businesses that started as SaaS platforms that eventually transformed, you know, into transactional marketplaces. No, and there's a there's a we, you know, this morning we were talking with, 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 with a friend and, and founder of Platomic. I mean, that's certainly, you know, the strategy that Platomic followed. No? Initially, they had a platform that pretty much implemented in a whole bunch of clubs that, you know, that, that, that manage bookings for, uh, for tennis courts or paddle courts. Um, and, you know, they had that. They were able to get the users of the clubs into their own platform, and then eventually they were able to go transactional. And are now, right now, they are monetizing based on the fact that, you know, that they have a, a very strong usage, uh, and they have a great product, and they start to monetize on value-added services. And, um, and there's, there's also something to say, very interested on that, on value-added services that I will mention before. But, but you know, um, we, we've seen, we've seen I, mentioned, I mentioned this company before, uh, you know, it's Shopify for brick and mortar SMBs. Very funny story um, on the Shopify thing and, and the size enable, and enablers. Uh, we start to see a lot of uh, you know Shopify verticals for different segments. We've seen for restaurants. We've seen for other uh, management of infrastructure. And I think that there's an opportunity there. Um, about 12 years ago. I got approached by, by, by a friend who was graduating from university and said, hey, I want to build the, the Shopify of Latin America. No? And, and then uh, he said, well, uh, I don't have any money, and I want to test this. And, and we told him, OK, we'll give you a couple hundred thousand dollars. And they said, yeah, we want you guys to be our partners, blah, blah. We gave them $200,000. Um, they started a company um, where we had a pretty reasonable ownership for the amount of money that, that we gave at that point. Um, and these guys p uh, spend about seven or eight years with pretty much no traction. And then suddenly, uh, in 2018, they exploded. And they started to grow absolutely exponential, no? and up to the point that the company raised capital at a $3.5 billion plus valuation, you know, and, and, and you know, started to go vertical. So these guys have created a fantastic Shopify experience, and they are starting to customize that product into going to different verticals. This is a company in Latin America. Now, how can we talk about opportunities and don't talk about auto? I mean, there's a lot of very interesting uh, disruption that Europe has created compared to the US. And I think it has, to be, it has to do with the fact that the markets and the dynamics of the local incumbents in the markets are very different than the ones that you see in the US. In the US, you have very strong offline auction players. And not set in, in some of the European countries, you also do that. But I think that plays a lot into how some of the categories have developed and how some of the models have decided to go from listings to transactional. And you know, we, we, we have seen very, very different uh, approaches you know, from the B2B model, where you know, companies try to sell dealer to dealer, you know, to the traditional auto one uh, model where you go consumer to business and you know, pretty much source so that you can sell uh, to consumer. Uh, or end-to-end or -end experiences. Uh, you know, uh, we are investors in Spini in India, doing very well. 
Kavak is a very interesting company that has suffered a lot from what has happened in the market, but certainly a very interesting experience. Multiples in these categories have compressed really, really dramatically, and the valuation of some of these companies have you know, come down very significantly, but not necessarily because I don't think that, not necessarily because the viability of these models is not correct. I think it has to do with the fact, you know, that, that multiples outside, uh, you know, uh, on public markets have been very strongly, you know, beaten, and, and that obviously reflects into a lot of these uh, companies, especially on the private ones. Um, so, so again, uh, classifieds, you know, should start requiring the consumer experience. Uh, E-commerce models require significant investment. They are capital intensive. Uh, and C2B models are interesting when you really can tap into existing players to operate in an asset light model. We are not very big fans of, of businesses that want to take inventory you know, and turn it around. Now, sometimes you have to do it, but we much rather prefer business models where you, you, know, where you don't take on the inventory. Um, now, very interesting disruptive uh, trend that we are starting to see in some of the most emerging markets, uh, you know, in terms of C2C businesses. Um, the cost of logistics have always been a very important piece of, you know, the transaction. And generally, when you are talking e-commerce, even at scale, you know, for, for lower ticket items, it can be as high as, you know, 8, 10% of the average order value of the transaction. And these guys have figured out a way that I'm going to explain you what they are doing. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that necessarily this model works in more developed economies, but it certainly does in more, uh, uh, in, in, let's say, where labor, in economies where labor is cheaper. Um, and, you know, these guys have been able to bring down the logistics cost to about 1% of even lower average cost uh, items. No? And there's a company, there's a company um, called Mazadat, Mazad, Mazad at <laughs> that, um, that pretty much do C2C auctions. And what they've done is to create, an, you know, to create a platform of physical locations in different strategically located places to provide you know, uh, the, the people who buy and to sell with a much better and safe experience. A lot of the uh, problems that you see in, in emerging markets uh, is that People don't feel safe when they transact on a C2C way. And you know, having the ability to go to a place that is well branded, you know, that it's secure, you know, and where you know that you're gonna get the payment and they're not gonna steal from you, it's it's efficient. And these guys have been amazingly smart in building volume and understanding where they have to locate these physical points and be able to you know, to lower their logistics costs dramatically. In fact, we were talking the other day to a, to a company that is doing something very similar to this in Kenya. No? So it's, it's a very interesting trend that I wanted to show because we feel that maybe so even in emerging markets, there is something, so in developed markets, there is something to do here. Um, another very important trend is the rise of live stream shopping. No, I, at the end, I think this is something that is still not clear. You know, we don't have a, still a large number of companies that are doing this very effectively, but we are certainly believers that by utilizing, you know, video, uh, there, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to enhance the customer experience. And we start to see that there's a number of verticals that are being built around the video experience, no? Companies in the beauty space, in the fashion space, company like the lobby or, or, or in the food space. And that's a tendency that we continue to see. We are, you know, we are, we are very fortunate because we are uh, a very prolific investor. We get about 150 deals per week. Uh, so that means that we see over 7,000 companies per year, which is pretty interesting. And, and, and it's very evident when a trend starts to emerge, automatically we start to see, ah, wow, you know, we got three companies here, four companies here. And then we start to see that there's trends that emerge and that's, you know, actually something that we like to capitalize on when we start to see that. And I'll talk a little bit about how do we think about geo, you know, geo arbitrage or business model arbitrage. Then we say, ah, you know, this is starting to happen in the US. What's happening on this sector in Europe? Or what's happening in this business model that is going vertical somewhere else, no? And that's, in a lot of cases, that gives us the light of saying, hey, let's proactively go to see what's happening in this vertical or in this particular market you know, and try to look for certain specific opportunities. And we found some very interesting models by just doing that. 
Uh, and then, then, then uh, this is Im impossible not to talk about because a lot of people don't think uh, the same way we do in this, and, and I'm happy to say that because at the end we are very big believers in blockchain and we are also very big believers on, on the value of decentralization for the future of marketplaces. Having said that, that doesn't mean that every single marketplace is going to be decentralized and there's not going to be centralized value, as I was mentioning before. Now, the capabilities and enablers that you get from crypto to be able to have an effective decentralized marketplace system can be very powerful. No? Um, so, so you know, one thing is to be crypto focus, and another thing is to be crypto enabled. No? And, and, and we see op companies that are saying, OK, I'm going to be crypto focused. A perfect example of that is OpenSea, uh, which is a vertical. Uh, and then you know, we have companies that are crypto enabled that they just use the blockchain and the crypto uh, uh, coins to be able to create certain type of incentives into the dynamics of the marketplace. And I think that's something that we're going to see more and more developing into the future. No? And uh, the tokens generally have to be a tool that marketplace entrepreneurs can utilize either to you know, incent demand, uh, provide the right incentives to customers. You know, and there is a lot of different things that you can do on the tokenomics side of it that are going to be determinant in the future of, you know, uh, of marketplaces that become crypto enabled. So, so we, are, we are quite bullish. I have to say that we have started doing a lot of this um, uh, I think since 2017, we said, well, we believe that the dynamics of the Web 3.0, you know, are going to have a very strong impact in, in, in the way we do things into the future. So we wanted to learn. We started to invest. And we've been learning. And, 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 and frankly, even liquid, liquid crypto and, and, and coins have very similar uh, dynamics of, of the way that a marketplace operates. No? Uh, they, are, they are actually marketplaces. So, so we also like to think a little bit as an intellectual curiosity side of thing, you know, where are those things going to go? Um, and the, the, I was mentioning briefly this, and I wanted to share this as well, because a lot of the benefit that we get from seeing things in different places help us come up with new ideas. No? And, and, and generally, uh, there, is, there is four ways that, you know, that, that, that we see new ideas emerging. One is, and we love, you know, when entrepreneurs come to us and they say, listen, I've been having this problem, you know, and I was really motivated because I wanted to fix it. And, I, you know, and I've been dealing with this situation for the last years, and, and I didn't find anyone who could solve it for me. And, and when you see that, you know, that clearly creates, you know, a very good reasoning for the entrepreneur to be very passionate, which, which is super important. Having said that, of course, a lot of other things have to work. Now, the geographic arbitrage, I mean, my partner Fabrice and myself, we started our career doing this. I mean, we built businesses that were proven in the US and, you know, and we build them in different geos. So I think that opportunity has you know, slowed down significantly because the market is moving much faster. So you start to see more capital availability in emerging uh, markets uh, or other markets that are not necessarily the US. And you start to see innovation. We're starting to see amazing innovation from Europe. We see amazing innovation from, from markets like India or China. So, you know, the opportunity of geo-arbitraging something from the US to other markets maybe has changed, but now we start to see opportunity of geo-arbitraging maybe from other markets to the US. No? So, so, so there is still a very big value in thinking, okay, which one of these models we, we think work in certain geos, and how would these models work in other geos? Is there companies that are doing this in other spaces? You know, and can we learn something from that? Then, then the other one, the other one is you know, the, the business model arbitrage. So you know, sometimes we find a business model that works incredible, incre incredibly well for a certain vertical, and we say, hey, what about building this one for a different vertical? No? And then we say, ah, who is doing that? And then we realize, ah, maybe there is already two people doing this for the same category in the same market, or there is people doing it in another market. You know, and this is, this is a very interesting uh, you know, source for us you know, to, to think about what areas or what things we want to focus on and, and, and look for opportunities. No? And then, then the other one is, we talked a little bit about it, which is the verticalization and unbundling. I mean, who would have told us when we saw the musical instrument vertical category of eBay, you know, that was about $900 million in volume, that there was going to be a separate company that was going to be built with a very similar user experience, 
going completely vertical and building a business that, that, that eventually had 1.2 or 1.3 billion in GMV. So, so you actually grew the category from having a specific vertical from eBay that was worth 900 million to you know, an independent vertical that didn't take out market from, you know, from eBay, it just created a new market. No? And I think there's a great opportunity for to do that as well. Now, very briefly, uh, how do we invest? Um, and I, I just mentioned this because I think it's, it's interesting for the audience based on what I'm saying. How do we capitalize on all of the opportunities that we are seeing? We are focused on what we understand very well. We don't lead rounds and we don't join boards, which is super important because at the end, we don't want to step on the feet of other people. We bring a vertical expertise. And you know, when we write a check, we want to be a complement to the round, both to the entrepreneur and to the investor. Most of what we do is earlier stage, uh, precede, seed, and series A, but we've been quite stage agnostic. A lot of times, there's things on series B onwards that we missed before, or we passed for the wrong reasons, you know, and there's no reason why we don't want to come in later, no? and, and we want to capitalize on that. And even though we are, you know, 65% of what we do in the, is in the US, or DNA is still very international. No? And in terms of what are the things we care about when we invest, everybody says, ah, you know, we want to invest in the best team. But what does it mean, the best team? And, and in our case, it means fantastic founders with great storytelling telling skills, very metrics driven. We like people to see, you know, to show us that they think about money in, money out, how am I going to make money on this, and, you know, pretty structured in terms of the analytical side of it. And, you know, clearly very passionate about what they're doing and relentless, you know, be able to, you know, to go and eat the world and, 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 you know, try to find solutions of everything that comes in front of them. We like the business, you know, to have a number of characteristics. We have, I mean, my, my partner Fabrice in his blog talks a lot about, you know, the nine different things that we like to find in businesses. Uh, but, you know, some of them are being big, uh, growth, being able to be the first one, etc. cetera. Um, we are quite sensitive to price. We are not just the type of people that go into everything. We like to see a certain correlation between price uh, and traction. And then we like things to be, you know, based on our investment thesis that, as I mentioned before, goes verticalization of marketplace, managed marketplaces, B2B. Um, I mentioned this briefly. We only invest in a very small percentage of these we see, even though we do 150 to 200 transactions per year. We have a funnel of about 7,000 companies or more. And you know, we tend to invest in about 3% of the deals we see. Now, it's also true that of the 7,000 that we see, there is a lot of those that we don't get deep, not because they are not interesting, just because we don't have the time or ability to be able to evaluate them quickly in a streamlined fashion. No? Um, and this is, we, we have developed a framework. You guys can, can, access, can access that in, also in, in, in Fabrice's blog. Um, to think about what are the important things to look at when we think about evaluating a marketplace. No? And um, on one side, uh, we like to understand how the company is growing. Uh, we like to understand how capital efficient the company is. Um, we like to think about what is the multiple and price that is being paid based on traction. And this becomes more relevant as you become bigger than when you are smaller. And the reason for that is because when you are smaller, you are growing much faster. So you generally grow into a reasonable multiple much faster than you would on an overpriced company in the later stage. Uh, we also like to think about the take rate and, and you know, the, the, the GMV uh, metric, see how that performs. And then uh, marketplaces uh, can have very different gross margins. So, you know, I can, I can tell you of a, of a listing marketplace, for example, the take rate of a listing marketplace is very, very small. Generally, you, you can get, if it's purely advertising, maybe 3 4 5% of take. When you go transactional, maybe you can get much higher than that. But, but, but for those advertising businesses where you have a take rate of 3 or 4%, the gross margin is north of 80%. So you know, even though you have a low take rate at the end, whatever you end up making on the transaction can be very high, even at a low take rate. No? So these are the type of things that we like to understand. We like to see even though the take rate might be lower, what is the gross margin, how does that correlate, and then how is the business growing, what are the multiples that are being paid uh, based on that growth. This is a, this is a, a metric, uh, matrix that, that, that we developed. It's, it's, it's not perfect, you know, but, but, it, but it certainly talks about 
you know, some of the in interesting metrics that we see. Uh, most of this is for marketplaces, not for SaaS. Uh, of you know, where companies are generally in GMV, where do we expect them to see in revenues, um, you know, what should be the annualized revenues, what type of growth do we expect for different stages. No? And you know, just to take an example, um, you know, for, for companies to be in Series A terrain, we feel that they need to be at least between 500 to a million in monthly GMV, which is you know, 10 million plus uh, GMV run rate on a yearly basis. Um, you know, and, and, and obviously, depending on the take rate, you know, to, to, to be between you know, 500K and, and three or four million of, of, of annual revenue. Um, you know, and, 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 and then uh, in terms of growth, we still like to see businesses that grow you know, two to three X on a yearly basis when they are doing a Series A. You know? So this is, again, this is not perfect, and, but, but it, at least it tries to provide a framework for people that want to understand whether, ah, am I in Series A terrain? Am I uh, there yet, or should I need to grow more, or should I need to do something different with my tech so that I can, can grow and scale? Okay, so now let me tell you very briefly what I see in the future coming. Um, interest rates are going up. We all know that. I don't think that's rocket science. And when interest rates go up, uh, prices go down. At the end, the discounted cash flow models, when you include a higher interest rates, mean that the prices have to get reduced. And that's why you know, we have seen a very strong correction in the public markets. Uh, that correction takes longer in the private markets, but we are starting to see some of that, some adaptation of that. So, but we certainly expect that you know, with the continued rise of interest rates, it is still likely that the prices might go down. Uh, on the macroeconomic perspective, I'm not incredibly bullish, to be very honest. Uh, I think that we have a couple of years that are going to be quite challenging. But at the same time, uh, it is in, in times and markets like this that great companies are being built. And I think that we should be counter-cyclical you know, and, and be deploying more capital when, when the opportunities you know, are there. No? And, 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 and you know, certainly from the FJ Labs perspective, we want to continue to you know, to, to, to be aggressive on that, on that side. No? And something else, when, when, whenever there's a crisis, it's also true that a lot of the capital flows back into the US. Uh, it is also true that, thanks God, some of the markets outside of the US are way more developed today than, the, than the, they were you know, when previous crisis. But still, a lot of people that are investing outside of the US decide to bring back some of that capital in the US. And that certainly has some of the impact that we've been seeing on the currency, you know, the currency getting stronger. You know, and that can have you know, very tricky implications in the, in the long term. No? Um, so, so in sum, we think that uh, you know, what does this mean for companies? I think, in general, companies are thinking much more about having a clear path to profitability. Everybody that we talk in our portfolio is thinking more about burn today than about anything else. And, and everybody is thinking, OK, how much cash do I have when I need to raise again? And frankly, the big tendency that we're seeing is, and I think that's a smart tendency, is everyone trying to either correct burn or go out and raise additional capital to be funded for the next 24 you know, to 30 months, at least, you know, and be able to say, OK, I need to have capital to be able to pass through this cycle and be able to put it to the to, to the future, no? And um, we are still not seeing a lot of down rounds in the earlier stages, and I really hope that we are not going to see too much of that because down rounds, you know, don't create the right dynamics. And whenever you go through a down round as an entrepreneur, it's actually a pretty painful situation because it creates a lot of cultural trouble. Um, but I do think that 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 because of how frothy the market has been, we're going to start to see more and more of that, hopefully not that much in the earlier stages, because I still believe that some of these businesses are going to be able to grow you know, relatively fast into reasonable valuations. And they might raise flat, uh, especially companies that go from seed to Series A. I, I am sure that we're going to see much more of, uh, you know, of down rounds in companies that are Series B onwards. Now, the implications for them are probably less impactful, but that's something that we will see. Um, in terms of opportunities, uh, liquidity is key. Um, uh, so it's important when, when you are running your companies to make sure that you keep in mind that in these moments cash is quite important. So every cent that you spend, think twice. Um, 
And at the end, uh, as I said before, we are in a, in a moment uh, of crisis uh, with a very big level of uncertainty because of the whole bunch of problems that we have in the world. I'm still very positive, you know, that technology has an incredible democratizing, uh, you know, effect in making the life of people better. Uh, and I think that we here are, are working, you know, in, in making the world better. So at the end, I think technology will, will, will be there, but, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have, you know, some interesting moments coming up into the future. Um, and, and, and just to, to, to wrap it up, um, uh, that's kind of my or macro perspective of how we are seeing things and the impact that we see for entrepreneurs earlier and later. Um, in terms of marketplaces specifically, we've been playing our cards in a certain way for, for the last uh, years, and we continue to see massive opportunities in the four dimensions that I mentioned here. On one side, the verticalization of horizontals, you know, the shift of businesses that are operating on a double commit model where you need interaction between the supply and demand uh, into what we call marketplace peak, you know, where the marketplace play, uh, plays a more, more important role in the definition of, uh, you know, who the supply should be. Very interesting uh, trend in B2B. A lot of people say, ah, you know, making B2B models is complex. It is complex because you need to have a very you know, clear vertical industry expertise, but you can build that. I think that a lot of these traditional industries are so obsolete that the opportunity to disrupt a lot of their processes is, is really huge. And the economics and the dynamics of marketplaces uh, in the B2B space tend to be even more attractive, Hi higher order value, or average order value, higher gross margins. So, you know, the dynamics of the B2B is very interesting. And as I mentioned before, we are quite bullish you know, on the future of crypto. Um, so, you know, this is, this is just, uh, you know, a, a touch of where we feel that uh, opportunities will continue to come. We are super bullish on the role that technology will be playing um, into the future. And we are excited to continue, you know, to invest in amazing founders and, and frankly, to have the opportunity to do a lot of stuff with people like here in the room. So thank you very much. I, I don't know if we have any time for questions. I, I think we are kind we, of running can, over, but I let it questions. to you guys to decide. Yeah, I think we can do questions, right? Guys? Yeah? Do we have any questions in the room? Ah, there you go. Good. It's always on. So first of all, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I'm very curious about uh, the different examples that you gave. Um, I'm a founder myself, so it's interesting how you compare horizontal to vertical uh, business and investment opportunities. And you mentioned OnlyFans, and to me OnlyFans is, is, is a horizontal approach in an example. So does that mean you wouldn't invest in the next OnlyFans? No, it does not mean that. I, I think that, that, you know, the, if you think about the evolution of horizontals versus verticals, it has always depended on the existing market structure. So there's been, there's been countries where horizontal players have been incredibly dominant at the beginning. I mean, Holland is, is, is a very, it's a small market, but it's a very clear example of, you know, horizontal marketplaces being very successful. And not only that, of having some of those horizontals being very effective in building some of the verticals and creating barriers. So, uh, you know, initially the, the, first, the first way to think about a marketplace is to say, hey, let's go horizontal, because it gives you more depth into a market. You know, and generally on smaller markets, it gives you a better opportunity to capture a, a, a bigger potential. Now, as you start to think about how do I build defensibility to this market, then you say, okay, as a horizontal, I could start building very, very customized experiences. You know, I'm, I'm, I sit in the board of a company called Wallapop, which is a mobile classified business, you know, that, that, that we ended up being shareholders because of a company we built in the US. But, but, but you know, we, we've been very clear about the need of going vertical and protecting some of these verticals on the horizontal experience. Now, sometimes the market is big enough or is developed enough that, 
you know, that certain verticals become much bigger, and when the horizontal doesn't make a good move, you know, in creating some of those vertical barriers, it just gives open space. No? So, so, so the answer is, there is great opportunities to build still horizontal marketplaces, but it depends a lot on the local market dynamics. Probably do two more questions. Anybody else? Hi, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. You've touched on different models and trends, but when it comes to marketplaces, is there anything you're particularly excited about? Is there one thing, uh, for example, marketplaces solving a key problem um, that we're currently facing as, as consumers? I mean, I think a lot of the businesses that I mentioned are solving very real problems, and I think that when you think of the big picture, why do we do what we do? Um, is because I truly believe that, that, that the benefits that marketplace can bring, marketplaces can bring in the, in the life of people you know, are very significant. And you know, from you know, being able to find someone that takes care of your kids, you know, to be able to find you know, food for you when you don't know how to cook or you don't have the time, you know, I, th I think that it's creating you know, very significant value in terms of you know, how do we live our lives, and that's actually our inspiration. So is there a very specific one that I could mention? I, I mean, I think a lot of the ones that I mentioned I'm quite passionate about, and that's why we, why we continue to, to move in that direction. But it's also true that I do see that there is, there is a number of technology uh, improvements that would dramatically impact um, the development of marketplaces. I think that the processing of information is one of them. The ability to, to be better in the way you process information through artificial intelligence. You know, a, a lot of those functionalities can, build, can be built into, into the marketplaces and make, you know, spe uh, more specifically with services, but also with, with goods, you know, can make uh, very, very significant improvements on you know, how do you get the products and how do you deal with the information that you get and you as a platform, you know, what type of things do you want to sell or push to your clients? No? Okay. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I have a question more from the fund perspective. So you guys invest a lot, but you also do a lot of exits. And with the secondaries, which have been one of the main options how you exit the companies, given the current turbulences on the growth stage, uh, it seems like this option will be, let's say, limited. How do you see this uh, going forward in the next two, three years? Whenever you have, a, well, first of all, it is true that our business model is very different than the traditional VC model. We invest into a lot of companies, and we have small positions. Having those small positions give us the opportunity you know, to be able to do things that traditional investors potentially cannot do. When there is a, a significantly large up round, a lot of times founders have come to us and said, hey, guys, would you mind selling some of your stake? Why? Because I need to bring in this investor. I don't want to get more dilution. You know, and you know, and at the end, uh, you know, if these guys don't have a certain level of ownership, they will not invest. So, believe it or not, a lot of the times that we've done secondaries have been driven by the fact that, that we needed to be accommodating. At the same time, uh, we are also you know, valuation sensitive, as I mentioned before. And when I see companies that I could, that, that I could potentially sell at a price that I think the company is going to take 18 to 24 months to grow into, to what I think is a reasonable price. Not because the company is not good, it's just because the opportunity cost of the money is very high. So when I think that the company will not grow into the valuation fast enough, uh, so, sorry, uh, in a period of 18 to 24 months, uh, and I could monetize a 10x plus by selling 15% of my position, 50% of my position, you know, that framework works very well for us. And in a lot of cases, uh, when we think that is the case, we proactively go and look for secondaries. But that doesn't mean that our business model is based on that. That makes our DPIs much shorter, which means that we return capital much faster. 
But that doesn't mean that, that, that we have not made incredible returns by holding companies longer. No? So um, we will continue to be proactive. It's true that when you have a crisis, the first thing that rises up is secondaries. And right now, there's companies that we were able to sell at 20% premium of the last round, that even if we price them at a 70 or 80% discount, we'll just not sell them. And not because they are not worth that. It's because there's no money or people that are wanting to take those type of, of opportunities. No, but, but again, we have to adapt to the different realities, and we've been doing so for many years. And, and you know, at the end, uh, we proactively look for opportunity to sell when we think we should. But it's also true that when the company is properly, properly priced, in a lot of cases, we write bigger checks, no? depending on what our perception is on, on when the company is going to grow into its valuation. No? And at the same time, we would never do something that the founders don't want. You know, uh, if we ever do a secondary, it's either because the founders ask or because it's orchestrated with the founders and the founders are supportive. No? Okay. With that, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, please give Jose Marin a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, guys.